Retired welder, this is for you and all of you that are interested. Sprocket size, how does that affect things? Can I run it? Can I run a bigger sprocket? Do I need a smaller sprocket? What am I doing? He asked me that this morning in the comment. He probably thought, well, this would be a simple one for him to ask. It's not. It deserves a video. I'm going to jump right into it. Three sizes of the common size. Seven. It's a seven pin. Eight pin. Nine pin. That nine's way bigger. There's, it's just one more to, driving tooth around the uh, outside. Okay, here's what your deal is. Those of you that's got any kind of uh, machine shop math, even a rudimentary scale, can figure out all kinds of things with us because you're going to use pi. Okay, for everybody else, I'm going to show you how this works. It is about surface feet. In one revolution, how far does that chain travel? And uh, so let's let's find out. I've marked a sprocket, and hopefully I can do this first time. And I kind of can. I'm going to remark this one because I smudged it. Okay, I'm going to bring your right eye down here close. Okay, here's what we got. With a 7 pin, see I've made a mark, I'm going to put it right on my line. Okay, and now we're going to rotate it one revolution. Okay, so this will be our 7. Our 8 tooth. I'll bring it back up so you can see it a little better. There's our eight. See it a little further. And here's our nine. I'm not trying to get stupid accurate. This is an example. Those of you that want to know the exact figure, do your math. This ain't about math for me right this second, okay? So, I'm going to just simply do a guesstimate. Seven. A pretty bad but you can't draw a straight line with a ruler, ain't it? There ain't nothing in this world straight. Okay, and then a nine. Alright. So here's what we did. Hopefully this works out with this little rule. Seven tooth is four and a half inches. Eight tooth is five and a quarter. Nine tooth is approximately five and uh, thirteen six. Well, it'd be seven eighths. I know it is. I got my line off. See that? Five and seven eighths. So. It went four and a quarter. Four and a half, five and a quarter. With four and a half. Okay, so seven was four and one half. Five and a quarter. Eight was five and a quarter.
9 was 6 and 7 8. Or five, I mean five and seven eight. Sorry about that. Okay, so read my hand scratching there. So it uh, there's a little bit of a funny thing there. So when you realize, let's just say your chain speed is your. Let's go saw RPM. Let's do that right here. For every revolution of that engine, it's going four and a half inches with a seven tooth. Okay, it's going another three quarters with an eight tooth. So it's five and a quarter. Nine tooth, five and seven eighths. That many exact figures, we know that. But you can see the spacing is fairly even. That uh, it, it, it probably... I'm off a little bit there, and I don't care. This is just an example. Okay, when you realize from a 7 to 8, in one revolution it travels that far. Now, let's just use an example of a cut speed of 10,000 RPMs. Okay, you would have to take that 3 quarter, and if you wanted to figure that per minute, you just times 10,000. Okay, so point seven five all. Now that's fast. There's a big difference in chain speed, isn't there? There really is. This is gonna be a long video, guys. Bear with me on it. I'm gonna do my very best. I'm not editing this. I'm just not. Okay, knowing that. Okay. The nine tooth is a bad idea. I Never tried one before. I got old Dave over here. Uh, there's old Dave. With a different bar profile, I probably could, but here's what I ran into. The nine tooth, the chain rides from here to here. It doesn't come in contact here. Now, with an eight tooth, it does. Okay, you can see that. Seven tooth, more so. What this stupid sprocket did, could that, Dave could pull that. Yeah, I can, no problem. But when I tried that, it was ridiculous. It it, it, it had to, it didn't, wasn't in it already. It was in the groove. It had to come into the groove about right in here. And it was spitting a chain like you don't know. I can't have that. Not when I'm trying to work and get something done. So, no, don't do that. And even if you got a powerful saw and want to try one of them, Unless you got a different pro, uh, profile bar on the end there. Don't do it. Okay. Saws come with seven teeth. There's a reason for that. You can pull that seven tooth with a 50cc on up saw. Uh, a little smaller than that, they go to six. Now, 70cc saw is the mainstay and I'll, for a long time in logging. So, we run a 7.2 sprocket on them, and uh, you're, you're, you're stuck with that chain speed. You can run a full house. Now, where the origin of the full skip chain, which I run a lot, uh, I've got a good example right here. The, the teeth on a full skip, you have a third less cutters. Because of the distance between the teeth, okay? And I'm going to try to do something that I didn't. I'm going to try to line them up. You see, right there, see, that's a lot closer. There's only one link between, you know, one band. And on the bottom one, there's two. You see that? So it's one-third less. It's one-third less. And 24-inch bar... Even 28 and some species you can run in hardwoods in the northeast. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to stress this really critically. You can run an 8 tooth on a 70cc saw. But what you're going to run into, you need to run full skip chain. That's why it was developed in the first place when people were getting away from the 80cc saw. <coughs> okay. Now. 
what I perceive of this is there's more than just that that uh, complicates issues. It is the fact that your raker, this is a, this change been sharpened once or maybe twice, the distance between right here and the working corner is short. Okay, that is fairly up and down. What happens then, as on stuff that has larger rings, the rings of your tree are your hardest spot. The space between, on most species, are softer. So if it's a long distance between the rings, let's say your rings are that long. The whole time, because that's got a point right there, the whole time, you don't think that'll do that, but it's doing that. It's riding up and down. Your cutter doesn't get a chance to actually cut right. It, it just... Boom, 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 like that. That's what it's doing. Now, when your chain gets wore back, the distance from here to here is much longer. It reduces that. Okay? It absolutely reduces that because it can't get so much. Now, here's another thing, and this is why I'm bringing this up. I know you guys like using filing gauges, and if you can't accurately set your uh, uh, rakers without it, you better use it. But I'm going to show you a little something. I file mine flat. See that? Yeah, I file mine flat. And I'll tell you why that is. That little point wants to go up and down all the time. When it's got a larger space, it's more distance. It, it has a tendency because it's more surface in contact with the wood when it's jumping from one ring to another. It keeps my working point more stable. The further back you go, the more this is uh, uh, inherent, okay? Now, with that being said, how does that affect my uh, chain speed? Faster chain speed with a chain wore back that far, that thing is blistering. When you increase your chain speed, decrease the thickness of your cut on a stock 70cc saw, okay? this It's a balance. There's a fine balance between all this, between a 7 tooth and an 8 tooth. Now, those of you that run full house on your uh, 70cc let's say with a 28-inch bar, let's just call it that. You have a crap load of teeth cutting in the wood at the same time. You've learned not to take your depth gauges, your rakers, down too far, let it form a chip, let it spit it out. Because if you take too much of a bite and you make that cutter right here, make a big chunk, It'll make a nice curly chip, but what it does, it can't doesn't have enough power to pull that. Well, you can run your eight tooth, throw a seven or throw a full skip chain on that, and have your speed. Okay, dead gaining speed help you. Okay, it's like I don't understand. You want another three quarters of an inch per revolution. Okay. But your problem is the distance from here to here is about three quarters of an inch when you add an extra strap, see? So, theoretically, now you guys that are loggers, get right in them comments. You correct me where I need it. Agree with me where I need it. I don't want nobody to humor me. I want you loggers that are pros to tell me if you see the same thing I do. That It's going to be interesting. So, in theory, because I can't as easily run a uh, full house chain, I am I stuck with a 7-tooth? No. No. Is there an advantage? Maybe. 
and I'm going to tell you what that is. Say, okay, seven tooth, I can run full house, which is normal spacing, but with full skip, I can run an eight tooth. I gain three quarters of an inch in a revolution, but my uh, teeth are three quarters of an inch, approximately. I'm not going to freaking chase little micros on this. They're three quarters of an inch, approximately, for their part. Well, why would they even bother coming out with that? Come on, let's get real about this. Okay, so seven tooth with full house theoretically cuts as fast as eight tooth with full skip. Even though we freed up some horsepower, we lost it in the bigger rim sprocket. Okay. Full skip was designed to be run with an 8-2 sprocket. I was on a ground floor when they developed it. They brought it out, and they brought out the chisel files. I know the deal on this of what they intended. You know, we get creative. We, we learn things as we go, too. Okay. Here's where your game is. And you got your bar buried. Roller nose. This whole part of the bar is in the wood. It ain't sticking through the other side so it can blow the sawdust out. You have, in full house chain, the chip is formed by two teeth. Remember we discussed that. This cuts one side of the, two, uh, of the chip and it comes back. This one cuts the other side, then it's released, and you have the space between the cutters. The chips will pile up right against your raker. That's what they do. Okay, you have that much room. Your bar is buried. It's doing that top side of the bar, around the tip, and bottom side of the bar. It spills. Those of you circle, uh, the circle mill guys understand spilling. And then it starts coming around the tooth, gets caught back up in, stops the process partially, recuts the sawdust, so you're spending horsepower recutting sawdust. All right, that's the deal right there. That's why. Okay, Iron Horse, what do you run? Okay, I run both. I really do. Um, it depends on the day. On what I know I'm cutting, which chain I want to run. If I'm cutting, I'm running a 24 inch bar and the tip will blast right through, and I'm running a 70cc saw. Once that bore cuts down, tip blasts right through, curl right around, set your wedge, zip it right off, full house is the way to go. On a 70cc saw, your tip is not going to blast through. I feel like I'm better off with full skip. Okay? I hope that part of it got explained well enough for you to understand. Now, where I come up with some of this crazy notions is run a circle mill. And those of you that run circle mill, get right in the comments. You, you, you try hard to start from the small end of the log. If the guy that bucked the logs did a good job, it's approximately one inch bigger on the on the opposite end. So you're coming in, you're kissing your bark, you're looking for a four inch face cut. That's how much you want to expose it. No, no less. You know, no more. I mean, that's what you're really looking for. As you come in that wood, that grain keeps stepping over and over and over in the board. Look at your boards on face cuts. You'll see what I'm talking about. And then it comes into a big knot, and that grain changes. Your blade wants to try to follow all of that, okay? Until the log becomes square. And then you stand your cans up, bum, 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 rip your 2 by 4s out, and away you go. You're good to go. But it's one side, because the log is round, is trying to pull. That's why circle mill's got a quarter-inch lead. The, the saw isn't straight. It's quarter-inch out. That's what it's doing, so that it walks its way in. Now, feeds and speeds. You know how the grain of that wood looks, and you know how fast to crowd it when to ease up. Like when you're coming in or not, you'll slow up just slightly, let it start burning through, and as it comes to the center of that knot, you go ahead and, and let it just rip. 
Now that makes a straight board. Okay, so fine, why are you telling me this? How's that affect the chainsaw? There's no way that, yeah, it does. When you have a round log and your chain and your rakers are optimum, but it's a monster and you start cutting in, you reach a point it'll get a grabby because it's going cutting in the circle part of the grain, okay? More funny pictures by Harvey. <laughs> okay. Right here. It's in this part. Okay. Once you get past all them, it quits jumping because it all becomes linear. It'll take it off easier, okay? So, here right in here, it gets jumpy when you get in, you start cutting, it'll start getting jumpy when you're optimum, and then by the time you get to here, it smooths up. That also is affected by how close the grain is. If the grain is a slow-growing tree, and the grain is real tight, probably ain't going to bother you as much. <coughs> but it is a density change, okay? And uh, so I'm hoping that I've helped you with this. I'm not going to reiterate. If you miss something, go back in the video because this is actually gets kind of tough to do. But uh, now, because I like my rakers flat, it's obvious I don't use a depth gauge. Yeah, you guys will argue the point. Oh, you got to do this. You got to do that. I ain't got to do nothing. Run a saw with me. Not just one chain. Run for many days. You won't catch my saw not cutting right. You won't. I'll promise you that. There's very few people that I've ever worked with logging that understood this relationship. I've just told you my secrets. I've just told you them. Okay? But there's few people that I've worked with that has a spot-on saw all the time. Well, mine isn't either. But I know by reading my chips. Do I need to be less raker? I'll take a second, go zip, 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 maybe half a swipe. Um, if I catch them where one tooth's back further than the other, uh, you give it a little more. Now, this is something that's going to be hard to do. I was not trying to make this a sharpening video, but here I go. It, uh, I'll do a sharpening video, I promise. It just ain't going to be for a bet. I, just the way it is. And uh, So we'll mount that right up. And we're going to get you... Hopefully, where you can see this, and you're not, I'm not going to be able to unless I spread the legs of this thing apart. Maybe I can do that. Oh, my God. Three-legged woman. Okay, here's the deal. I lay my raker file from this point to this point. Okay. Just like that. That flashlight right there. Maybe I can do it with this. Okay, here's what I want you to see. Now, this ain't a straight, but you can see. Boy, I have trouble with this stuff. Right there. Okay, and that's that one right there. That's how thick it is. I look at that thickness, and then I go to the next one, and I look at that. I don't care how long or short your tooth. You have a brand new tooth here and worn right down to nothing. This gets me pretty good, okay, by doing that. And I switch to the other side and on and on and so forth. And uh, this is another good thing to show. Jeekers, creepers, I ain't going to be able to stop with this, okay? So I'll lay, I'll lay my file down on that. Eyeball how much gaps in there you get where you do this pretty good in these areas and If one's a little closer to the other, I'll take three quarters of a stroke or a half a stroke Yeah, I work at that fine. I'll work a half stroke. I took just a little zip off a couple of them, but they are They are flat You guys that know how to get this stuff focused. I need help learning 
I suck at this. But hopefully you can see that mine are flat. That's the way I do it. And if you notice, this tooth's longer right here than this tooth. It is. This raker is just a little higher. This was down just a little bit. This is a method I've used for 25 years guaranteed, at least. Okay, now I'm going to show you something about bore cutting. And I shouldn't be doing all this right now, because, but I, I, maybe it'll make it easier. It'll help you guys. Your safe part of your bar in the bore cut is right here. That's safe. That's your gray area. Guaranteed kickback right here. You're in this area here to here, you're going to kick back. So coming up, about a third. You know, let's put third, third, and third. Okay? About one third, you can roll that bar in and let them teeth gather the wood. If you try to go straight in, it bounces right back. Your most kickback is up here. You'll see that lemon. That's a high, high kickback area. Don't do that. Stay in that one third from the point center of that sprocket to here. This is safe right in here. Okay. And you watch me cut and you watch other loggers cut, the bore cut. We learn how to work it up to about right in here somewhere. Okay. But here's the deal. With the full skip chain. See this tooth? It comes around. You have a large area. See that? This is higher kickback chain. There ain't another tooth following it. The most you have is two teeth at any given moment on the end of your bar. And then another big gap. See how that works? Okay. So when you're bore cutting with this stuff, you better have that saw wound right up and be real easy on on your feet. It's all feeds and speeds because it gives it a chance to get to the next tooth. Now let me show you something. Well, I told you this is opening a can of worms. Okay, I know you guys can't do that, some of you. Get a chain tangle up, go flip, flip, flip. Okay, look at this. Got one right here, you got one right here, and you got one right here. You got three teeth working together instead of two. This one has less kickback because of that. I'm just making you aware of things I know. Okay? And as you see that go around, you see three teeth working at it until it gets to straight again all the way around. So be aware when you're running full skip what you're dealing with. I'm going to get you all wonky here and at a weird angle. I don't care because it's just one of them days. So, did we learn anything? Am I dead right? Is, can you find this in the books? Probably not. I'm telling you the way I see it. I'm telling you what works for me. It, uh, Bucking did that video on chain tension. Crazy good. Crazy, crazy good. But I'm going to elaborate something that I'm suspicious of. When these chains don't want to be uh, linear like this, they want to be round, centrifugal force. You guys know how that works. As you go from a 7 tooth to an 8 tooth, the speed makes it want to be more round yet. Yeah. Um... I like a loose chain, except for when I'm doing a lot of lemon or I'm in brush. I'll stop, pop, pop, boom, tighten that up. It's faster for me to make a slight adjustment, tighten my darn chain up so I can get through that than it is to wait till it falls off, which is just momentarily. But I actually, a lot of times, let my chain be just a whisker droopy. On the bottom, the links aren't even come in contact. Uh, with a bar there, I mean, you can pull it, you can pull the, uh, I mean, a whole bunch of drivers right, right out of that bar, just boom, 
get space right under them because I don't like cha stretching chains. It's hard on the sprockets. Once you stretch that chain, bulldozer guys, tell them, when you run your sprockets tight or your chain tight on your tracks and you start working that hard for, and you keep them that way, that stretches them lengths, don't it? Then when they hit the sprocket, they just bind up and jump and jump and jump and jump. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be able to tell how many of you watch this to the end. How many of you have screwed up your sprocket already by running your chain too tight? And it won't glide like what Bucket showed you. It won't glide. It goes, tong, 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 tong. That chain stretched. Take your chain and move it like this. You'll always get a little bit because you'll get some initial stretch. But if it goes clunk, 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 every place that it goes around, that chain is longer than each one of these. So it goes tunk, 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 tunk. That's what it does. That robs horsepower. The two places you know I port saws. I'm going to tell you how to get more power out of your saw than a port job as, as a rule. Learn how to maintain your chain properly and your chain tension properly so that, number one, it's cutting to its optimum. Number two, the darn thing isn't binding up going chunk, 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 chunk. I want you guys to grab your freaking chain and pull that. If that don't glide, you're wrong. Loosen it up. Just plain do it. And you say, well, gee, however I loosen it up, and it didn't matter. Well, sucks to be you. Run it. Suffer. Just know the next chain you put on. Throw another sprocket on because you screwed that one up too. Oh, you're going to argue that point too. Uh, I know what I'm talking about, guys. Uh, I argued all these points when I was young. And uh, it took me probably, I'll bet you I didn't have a lot of this stuff figured out until I got freaking 10 million feet under me of on Doyle scale. Uh I know that first two million, I thought I was just crap load hot. I did. I run from one tree to another. I'd bury that skitter. I'd be in three hours. I'd be two days ahead. And uh, then it dawned on me. The guy I worked for says, Harvey, you're killing that skitter guy off. You're not concentrating on putting the hitches together. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you cut for two days. I want you to whale them trees. I said, I want you to get ahead, and, and then we'll deal with it. I did that. My logger buddy did this to me. Best thing he ever did. Now, I hadn't run a skitter much up to that point. I knew how, there was no problem. He says, now you're two days ahead. He said, I want you to spend however long it takes, and you pull. Man, I'm going to tell you what. It took me four days to clean up. I was so pissed off at that cutter. You know what I did? I learned to slow up, do it right, do more wedging, do more cleanup, make it obvious where I want the skitter to come in by the tails, you know, uh, make things obvious. There might be two or three trees that if I just leave them standing and go by them, let them get a hitch two out of the way, come back through, I'd bark on them, uh, but I didn't make my face not cut, but I got lots of holding wood on the backside plus the hinge. And then I just go back through there, nip them, let them fall, mark them and top them. I, I tell you what, until somebody does that to you, you're only going to go so far cutting for a skitter. you got to know what skitters do. And uh, I paid my dues, guys. Uh, I had stories to tell. There's lots of time. There really is. Dozer Dan. Or Dozer Dennis. Dozer, yeah, hi, Dozer Dan. How you doing? Yeah, what do you think of that, guys? Dozer Dennis did this with his chainsaw for me. Remember him on the channel? Go over and check Dozer Dennis out. He's got a good channel. He's doing some pretty cool stuff. He's a BOCES a heavy equipment teacher. Uh, working with them hellions. But didn't he do a beautiful job? I thought so too. Goodbye.